This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Hello and welcome to another edition of Zenith, the program of and about research at the University of Central Florida. I'm your host, Ed Hyland. Today, a wide ranging show, which includes a look at a unique solar charging station on the UCF campus that allows you to fill up by plugging in. We'll also hear about the latest advances in using nanotechnology to treat medical conditions like Alzheimer's and spinal cord injury. Plus, my chat with a researcher who's on the cutting edge of new advances in LCD television and his connection to the original Game Boy. What I showed to my son you know, when he bought a, like a Nintendo Game Boy, yeah. <laughs> I asked him, how much should I charge you for the royalty? <laughs> <laughs> These stories and much more today on Zenith. About 30 years ago, a young researcher at Hughes came up with an idea for using a reflective display with liquid crystal technology. This direct view concept wasn't his main work, but they did find a use for it. Yes, an early player of portable game technology, Game Boy, owes a debt to Dr. S.T. Wu, now at the University of Central Florida. Dr. Wu continues to stay on the cutting edge of liquid crystal displays, and his lab is already finding new ways to improve the quality of pictures on everything we view. Liquid crystal has become a major display technology and it has uh, dominated the uh, flat panel display uh, market uh, for years. So it looks like uh, this uh, technology has uh, reached its uh, mature stage, at least uh, from a manufacturing uh, standpoint. And the application has uh, widespread uh, from like uh, iPhone, iPod, uh, games, um, a video player, a notebook, computer, desktop monitor to the large screen TV and the projectors. Okay, so the the remaining technical challenges are really in the couple of issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, response time uh, is still not fast enough. Second is um, the color uh, saturation and also the optical efficiency, yeah, that directly uh, translate into power consumption or the energy saving. So these are very important issues. And then uh, finally, the uh, sunlight readability, because uh, you know, we definitely like to see our cell phones uh, under direct sunlight, okay? So our group has uh, been working hard along these uh, important technical areas. And I do appreciate our uh, talented uh, students, uh, postdocs together, uh, either the present ones or the previous uh, uh, group members. They all make uh, important contributions uh, in these uh, important technologies. In the university, we uh, have more time to think, uh, to generate the uh, breakthrough approach. 
and the engineers in you know, manufacturing facility, they are be, their daily schedules are so busy in trying to improve the manufacturing yield, how to make, more, make a device uh, cheaper, uh, better. Okay? So everyone is uh, doing their own part. But you know, being a university researcher, we can only focus on the key part. Tennis, but at explosive speed. You know, if the liquid crystal response time is not fast enough, then uh, you will see image blurring in the fast moving objects. So for example, if you play golf or fast running or the uh, like Olympic, <laughs> okay, and uh, you won't see very clear image. So we work very hard here uh, to get a fast response time so that we can get a clear, crystal clear image. And also it will lead us to a next generation uh, approach that is to use uh, LED, RGB LED for color sequential display. Here, we can eliminate the current uh, spatial light, uh, uh, spatial color filter. So we will gain response time by three times and also resolution by three times. So gaining uh, re, uh, the uh, optical efficiency by three times means we will uh, save uh, energy by almost uh, three times. So this is uh, very uh, important, especially for the future green technology. A great example of Sony's range of content the is... The second the advantage of uh, uh, having this uh, high three times uh, high res higher resolution is because uh, we are ready to enter the 3D home theater TV. Okay? But you know, in the, the traditional approach of a 3D TV is to have one pixel for each eye. So the resolution is uh, reduced by two times. But now our approach is able to uh, resurrect uh, uh, resolution by three times. So that will be a, a very important one for future high resolution or even HD TV, 3D TV. As you know, our traditional CRT TV has only 72% color uh, gamma, gamma, okay, G-A-M-U-T. And um, uh, that, that means uh, it doesn't represent the true color, all right? But now by using LEDs, RGB, light-emitting diodes, then the uh, color gamma is uh, expanded to, according to our calculation, about 120%. So you know, for the human uh, history, display history, this is will be a, 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 a very important uh, breakthrough and uh, that will enable us to see the true uh, uh, vivid color. Now in our lab here, you don't see the uh, color work, okay? However, our uh, major uh, work approach here is to develop a technique uh, that enables this uh, fast response time. Okay, so this is the, uh, like a, we, we call the next generation approach. And uh, we use a name, you know, the, the approach, the new liquid crystal is called the uh, uh, blue face liquid crystal. Okay, and that, that breaks the barrier of a slow response time. And it, uh, it's a typical response time is about 10 times faster than we can get uh, as compared to the uh, present TV approach. If we can demonstrate uh, this uh, fast response time, then that will, I mean the uh, display manufacturer will implement this idea very quickly in, in their existing facility, okay? So that's why we uh, work uh, closely with uh, our partners. Uh, they are able to manufacture this uh, large screen displays. So in university, we have a limited uh, facility. So
So we can only work on the uh, key part, key core technology. But if we can get a breakthrough, then we can transfer uh, this uh, know-how or technology to display manufacturers easily. A key area of Dr. Wu's work is to have several forms of display crystals in your television or other viewing screen so that it can adapt and make it just as easy to see in bright sunlight as it is in a dark room. Speaking of sunlight, we are seeing more and more uses for solar power, including charging batteries we can then use in everything from iPods to our cars. UCF is unique in that it has a solar charging station on campus available to anyone with an electric plug-in car. A news event and partnerships brought the station into focus. It's just one of many cars on the UCF campus searching for a coveted parking spot. But there is a special place for this vehicle, and where it stops is also where it will be refueled. UCF alum and Orange County Mayor Richard Crotty does the honors of plugging in Florida's first factory-built hybrid electric vehicle. And the electricity charging this Ford Escape is coming from UCF's smart solar plug. The whole point of this research is to make sure that we, we stay in DC charging mode and not uh, what they do usually is they they get solar power and then they convert it straight to the grid. But we, what we're trying to do here is uh, get the sun power and then stay in DC, try to avoid that um, transformation step so that we can get a more efficient system out of it. So that's the whole you know, research behind this is to make sure uh, get a more efficient power flow between the sun and the charging the vehicle. If you look at the role that the university has played in economic diversification, which really I think has been a cornerstone of the decade, uh, it's just been, been a very vital part of what we're about as a community. The unique vehicle, which can get up to 120 miles per gallon, is being tested in Florida by Progress Energy. They, along with Ford Motor Company, joined UCF President John Hitt for a kickoff of this new generation vehicle. UCF Smart Solar Plug-In Research Facility captures the imagination, critical thinking, innovation, and hard work of our best researchers in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Applying innovation and creativity to solve real-world challenges in ener energy sustainability is something we do at UCF very well and very often. The Smart Plug is part of UCF's Climate Action Plan, strengthening UCF's status as an innovative leader in green operations, classes, and research. When not in use, the solar charging station will send its electricity into the grid for the rest of the university, which will help save the school money. One of the most costly aspects of health care is long-term care for conditions like spinal cord injury and Alzheimer's. Dr. James Hickman is applying nanoscience to find answers and hopefully lead to cures. Well, let, me, let me start off by saying that you know, the overall idea of our group is to try and create these uh, functional in vitro systems, which are something s somewhere between the single cell and the animal or the human models that most people in drug discovery and for looking at toxicology uh, start with. And so we create these systems are based upon uh, cognitive function or uh, motor function, cardiac function, muscle function, uh, lung function. And so what we're really focusing on for the Alzheimer's is trying to create models that mimic cognitive function. Um, and so um, what we want to try to do is, is look at cognitive function into the entire process. So we're looking at Alzheimer's in terms of trying to um, do something the pre mild cognitive impairment phase. Um, and for those of those who aren't really familiarized with, 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 with Alzheimer's, you sort of, what it's believed right now is you actually have, start developing the disease before you ever notice it, okay? And there's no markers really for that right now. Um, and then you start getting into something called mild cognitive impairment where it becomes noticeable. You start having some deficits. Your minimum mental status exam is, is, is starts going down from 30 and start getting into the high 20s. Um, and you start maybe having some, you know, behavior, some, some, some motor control deficits. Um, and that's called mild cognitive impairment. And then that then will go into either full-blown dementia or full-blown Alzheimer's. So what we want to try to do is use one of these uh, functional in vitro systems to start looking at it before the mild cognitive impairment phase. And how we thought we would try and do that is, is there's a molecule called A-beta or beta amyloid um, that causes plaques inside the brain, very, very well known. What is 
there's some controversy of, of whether or not the plaques actually are causing the Alzheimer's or whether or not it's the, the precursors to the plaques, which they call soluble oligomers, where instead of having, you know, hundreds and thousands of these um, amyloid beta molecules coming together, you only have maybe like, you know, two, three, four, five, which are still soluble. Okay, and it's been shown that these will stop the communication between cells. We say, well, okay, if we actually then dilute those down and look at them at fairly um, low concentrations, we might be able to start seeing what their effect is and mimic the pre-MCI portion of the disease. So we, we looked at the, the down into the nanomolar um, um, concentrations, and we looked at cells um, from the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of your brain that's sort of responsible for learning and memory, where a lot of information processing goes through. And it's also the first area that seems to go when people start having deficits in, um, uh, in memory and function um, from Alzheimer's and dementia as well. So we cultured those cells out and we put them on top of a, what is called a microelectrode array. Okay, so instead of going in and doing a much traditional way of, of recording electrical signals, what we did is we have an array of lots of little pieces of metal inside a silicon uh, device, uh, a silicon chip or, or microelectrode um, set. We put the cells on top of that and we can then record their signals non-invasively. So we don't actually have to do anything to the cells to monitor what they're doing. And then we treated them with low, very, these very low concentrations. And what we saw was that we, they stopped their electrical function. So they stopped firing these electrical signals that normally is necessary to transfer information. But they didn't look, um, they didn't die, they didn't look impaired, their morphology or you know, the, how they, they looked in culture didn't change. So they're isolated but just drifting? They're, well, they're actually adhered onto a surface. Okay. Okay, and so, but yes, they're isolated, they're, they have synapses and, and they're talking to each other and they're also, rec we're recording these signals mm -hmm. on the microelectrode arrays. Um, but what happened is, is all that activity stopped. But the cells looked like they were healthy. Okay, and so this to us mimicked what you would expect in um, the portion of the disease that's pre-myocognitive impairment, where we know that there's, there are diseases there, but we can't tell. Because then if you actually went into that tissue, okay, in a cadaver, which is how most Alzheimer's research is done right now, is, is looking and seeing after the fact. If you went into a cadaver who, you know, maybe you thought might have Alzheimer's or was predisposed, the tissue would look normal because you can't measure the electrical activity, okay, after a person is deceased, okay? So we said, well, aha, ha, this might be something we could develop a marker for and develop a target for to be able to look for, um, one is to be able to tell if somebody has this pre myocognitive impairment, and two, develop a target for trying to restore this function, this electrical function. Okay, um, again, pre myocognitive impairment. So, again, you could take a pill to prevent you from getting full blown Alzheimer's or getting even myocognitive impairment. Does it go as far back as perhaps being a predictor in terms of, uh, I mean, this is extrapolating basically what you're just saying, but is there, is there uh, some possibility that you would get to a point where you say, well, you may be predisposed because you have certain markers, you have certain things going on. Oh, oh, oh well, certainly we believe that... Um, I mean, years in advance, obviously. Um, yeah, th th that's one of the hopes is we'd actually have a marker that you're starting to exhibit some of this loss of electrophysiological function, of the, uh, the abilities of the cells to be electrically active, okay? And develop some sort of marker that says, okay, you're starting to exhibit this now, okay? Even though you seem like you're fine, you're, you're getting these deficits. It's kind of like, um, you know, a lot of people, they get screened for cancer, they don't know they have it, but people have developed things as like to look for mm -hmm. and say, well, okay, now you've got a really, really tiny nodule in, in, you know, your prostate or your breast or something else like that. We can remove it, you're never going to get cancer, and you're fine, okay? Um, you know, that's what we'd like to be able to do with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia as well. And so that's the next step is to start trying to say, okay, what is actually these oligomers affecting Okay, and so can we actually develop some sort of test to be able to see that deficit, okay, and, and develop that somehow, you know, through animal models and then through humans to be able to, to test that as well. Is this helping with our overall understanding? Because from what I have read, it, it is still uh, somewhat of a mystery as to why all this happens in the first place. 
and uh, so much of the research has to be done pretty much when the patient has passed away because you can't get in there and start sampling brain tissues. Well, that, that, well, well that'll lead me to my ex my, something else we we're actually doing uh, as well, I'll mention, um, where the problem I think with Alzheimer's is there's so much information out there that people think it's caused by tau, it's caused by soluble plaques, by, by, by uh, insoluble plaques, by soluble ligamers, by other factors, by inflammation, okay? So what's really hard is defining, okay, which one really is the causative and which ones are just sort of markers or just resultants, okay? So, yeah, you have plaques, but plaques really isn't what's causing the loss of function. They're just, just a marker that shows that, uh, you know, downstream that, well, you, you, you have this, 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 this problem. Um, you know, so what we're trying to do is to sort of figure out, okay, are the soluble ligamers something that actually is causing this, this, uh, this effect? And so one of the things we're actually able to do right now, and we haven't published this work yet, is we're now actually culturing out um, human neurons, okay, from Alzheimer's patients after they have passed. So we can culture them out from the cadavers if we get them early enough. And our hope is there by studying the disease tissue directly we'll start being able to try to understand, okay, what really is the effect that's causing the loss of function versus just a marker that people with Alzheimer's have. Getting back to your point of, you know, being able to look at the person after they have passed um, and saying trying to guess what might, might have happened, we can actually start looking at the, the neurons when they're alive, okay, in a system and start to say, well, okay, you know, where is the deficit actually in these human neurons? Because the problem, animal models are great um, for being able to, to think about targets and the test theories and everything, but they don't translate well into humans, okay? And, and so th this is a huge problem. So our hope is by starting to test or, or, or investigate the human neurons directly and then correlate it to some of the animal uh, models. We might be able to have that overlap that doesn't exist right now. Does, does your work at all um, uh, give us any, any hope or prospects for treating or at least detecting some of the early forms of other types of dementia other than just Alzheimer's? That's a really good question. We recently we were in um, um, talking to a pharmaceutical company that's interested in trying to get into this. And um, that's one of the big questions. Everybody's focusing on Alzheimer's. But, you know, really, I mean, Alzheimer's is, is actually not even the predominant a uh, form of dementia at this point, okay? You have all these other types of dementia. And so the hope is that we actually get a really nice functional test bed for the system. And then we can learn how to induce some of the deficits that occur from Lewy body disease, that uh, just from, um, you know, vascularization uh, difficulties um, in um, uh, people who have dementia. You know, and start looking at those, we might be able to look at other types of dementia as well, which are really not focused on hardly at all right now. Right now people are developing, um, trying to develop um, molecules either to treat Alzheimer's or hopefully eventually to try and reverse it um, or at least stop its progression. Um, and if you get something that also helps another type of dementia, that's great, okay, because a lot of it's symptomatic at this point. But very few people are actually focusing on other types of dementia at this point. And so hopefully our research will be able to help that cause, uh, that deficit as well. I'm sure there's a lot of folks who might see this and would say, well, gee, Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, uh, why aren't we moving faster? I mean, is, is there a cause? And, and not to sound crass, but I mean, is it just a case of we need more money for the research or, or are there some other elements that are slowing uh, the, the progress or are we making rapid progress? Well, you know, um, more money for research is, is generally a good thing. I mean, uh, I mean UCF used, I mean, not UCF, um, the state of Florida used to have a Alzheimer's fund. Mm -hmm. Um, but the budget cuts that got eliminated, um, you know, from a, from a statewide standpoint, um, that would be nice to see that um, reinstituted. Um, you know, because I mean, Florida has such an aged population that would really benefit from this. Um, you know, it just one of the big problems has been is that in clinical trials, people have focused on people who have Alzheimer's disease, and because there's no way of really picking out who's going to develop Alzheimer's beforehand. So part of it also is that the clinical trials that actually have occurred um, really didn't target the right population, okay? So another aspect of that would be more clinical trials and better clinical trials, which again, cost more money. Um, the problem is you really have to focus on companies for that 
and, and, and again, in a whole in the business climate, that, that's also a problem as well. But, you know, certainly, um, you know, more money on a statewide level, certainly at a, a federal level, um, would be helpful because you have all these competing theories out there right now. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is also they're not really focusing on the translational aspects of as much, the more the engineering aspects of building better systems. I mean, we still work in, as I said earlier, our, the focus of our group is to try and figure out something between a single cell and an animal or a human. There's very few tests out there that are doing that. So pretty much right now you do single cell experiments, okay, and then you go into an animal. And whether or not your animal or, you know, um, is, is representative of the disease, um, you're not really sure. Mm -hmm. And because we've cured, you know, 200 diseases in mice that haven't translated to humans. Um, and so, so part of it is, 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 yeah, more money, but also maybe refocusing a little bit more on developing better technologies versus just beating to death the same technologies that exist, that have been existing for the last 20 years. We'll hear more from Dr. Hickman next month on the next episode of Zenith. My thanks to Dr. Hickman and the other researchers featured today in Zenith. To see our archived shows, check us out online at www.ucf.tv and then scroll down the program guide to Zenith. We'd also like to hear from you with questions or comments about this or any other program on UCF TV. My email is on our website, ehighland at mail.ucf.edu. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. For Zenith, I'm Ed Highland.